Hey guys, um, so we are picking up where we left off and some big stuff is happening. Um, last time we were reading, um, Lewis was hearing his uncle tell him about somebody vandalizing um, Isaac's grave. Um, so he's kind of figuring out that what they did and who they tried to uh, bring back from the dead is a little bit bigger than what he anticipated. So we are picking up on page 94. Um, after their discussion, which came to no conclusions at all, except that there was um, dirty work afoot, Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman decided that it would be nice to take Lewis on an evening ride around the county. They knew he loved to ride, and since they hadn't taken him out in some time, they thought that maybe an excursion would shake some of the gloom out of his system. But when Lewis came home from school that day, he was depressed and worried. He had been thinking about the tomb business all day long. So when Jonathan pushed back his chair after dinner and asked Lewis if he'd like to go for a nice long ride, Lewis merely shrugged his shoulders and said, yeah, I guess I'd like to go in a dying cat sort of voice. Jonathan stared at Lewis for a minute, but he said nothing. He merely got up and went and got his car keys. Soon all three of them, Jonathan, Mrs. Zimmerman, and Lewis, were crammed into the front seat of Jonathan's 1935 Muggins Simoon, a big black car with running boards and a windshield that could be cranked open. The car spewing clouds of bluish smoke back down the rutted driveway into the street. They drove for hours as the afterglow of sunset stayed and stayed and the hollows filled with purple mist. They drove past barns with big blue signs on their sides that said, chew mail pouch. Uh, they drove past green John Deere tractors parked in deep muddy ruts. Uphill and downhill they drove over bumpy railroad crossings with X-shaped signs that said Rail Sing Railroad. If you read them the wrong way, though, little towns that were no more than a church, a food store with a gas pump outside and a flagpole on a triangle of green grass where the roads met. By the time it got dark, they were miles from New Zebedee. They were on their way home when, for no reason that Lewis could see, Jonathan stopped the car. He turned off the motor and he sat there staring at a row of green dashboard lights. What's wrong, Uncle Jonathan? asked Lewis. I keep imagining that I hear a car somewhere, he said. Do you hear it, Florence? Yes, I do, said Mrs. Zimmerman, giving him a puzzled look. But what's so odd about that? They do let people drive these roads at night, you know. Do they? said Jonathan in a strange voice. He opened the car door and stepped out into the gravel. Stay here, he said to them. He walked up the road a little ways and stood there, listening. Even with the car door open, Lewis could hear nothing but the wind and the roadside of the trees and the clattering of a tin sign on a barbed wire fence. The car was parked near the top of a hill, a high, of high hill, and now Lewis could see the headlights rising out of a gully and then dipped into the next one. Jonathan came running back to the car. He slammed the door and started the motor. With a squealing of the tires... He turned the car around and he headed back the way they had come. Lewis was frightened. What's wrong, Uncle Jonathan? He asked. Ask me later, Lewis. Florence, what's the best way? Um, what's the best way? Other way back to New Zebedee. Take the side road to your right. That's 12 mile road and it runs to the Wilder Creek Road and step on it. They're gaining. Many times when he had been out riding with his father and mother, Lewis had pretended that they were being followed by some car um, or other. It was a good game to pass the time on a dull, long, dull evening rides, but he remembered how he'd always felt disappointed when the mystery car turned away onto a side street or into a driveway, but tonight the game was for real. Around sharp curves they went, lurching dangerously far over and squealing the tires, up hills, down hills, then 70 or 80 miles an hour on the straightaway, which was never straight for long in these winding country roads. Lewis had never seen Jonathan drive so fast or recklessly, but no matter how fast he drove, the two cold circles of the light still burned in the rear view mirror. Mrs. Zimmerman and Uncle Jonathan seemed to know who or what was in the car behind them, or at least they'd seemed to know that it had someone to... Um, that had the power to do them harm but they said as little as possible except to um, confer now that and now and then about directions so Lewis just sat there trying to feel comfortable by the green dashboard lights and the warm breath of the heater on his knees of course he also felt comforted by the two wizards whose warm friendly bodies pressed against his in the fury darkness 
but he knew that they were scared and this made him twice as scared. What was after them? Why didn't Jonathan, Uncle Jonathan or Mrs. Zimmerman just wave an arm or turn an evil car into a wad of smoldering tinfoil? Lewis stared up at the reflected headlights and he thought of what he might have seen in the cemetery and of what Uncle Jonathan had told him about Mr. Izzard's eyeglasses. He was beginning to have a theory about how all of these fitted together. The car raced on, spitting stones from under its tires, down into the hollows bordered by dark skeletal trees, up over high hills and on and on while the setting moon seemed to race to keep them to keep up with them they covered a large part of the county that night because um, the way around was a long way after what seemed like hours of driving they came to a place where three roads met as a car as the car screeched around the turn lewis saw for a second a civil war cannon white with frost a wooden church with smeared glass stained window um and a general store with a dark glimmering window that said, Salada? Um, we're, in, we're on the Wilder Creek Road now, Lewis, said uh, Mrs. Zimmerman as she put her arm around him. It won't be long now. Don't be afraid. The car raced on, dead roads, uh, roadside stock bent on its hot wind and overhanging branches whipped along the metal roof. The burning white holes danced in the mirror as before, and it looked like they were getting closer. They had never, since the start of the chase, been more than two or three car lengths away. Jonathan shoved the accelerator to the floor. Uh, he, The needle moved up to 80, which was dangerous, to say the least, on these roads, but the greater danger was behind. So Jonathan took the big roundhouse curves as well as he could, and the tires screeched and the fenders almost touched the crumbling asphalt on the side of the road. This was the blacktop that you could go faster on than you could, lose, um, than you could on loose gravel. At last they came to the top of the hill, and there below them, glimmering peacefully in the starlight, the moon had gone down some time ago, was Wilder Creek. There was the bridge, a maze of crisscrossing black gar um, girders. Um, down the hill, they barreled faster and faster. The car behind them followed just as fast. They were almost to the bridge when the lights in the rearview mirror did something headlights had never done before. They grew and brightened till the reflection was a blinding bar of white light. Lewis clapped his hands to his eyes. He had, uh, had he been struck blind? Had Jonathan been blinded too? Would the car crash? Or suddenly, Lewis heard the rolling clatter of the bridge boards under the car. He took his hands away from his face and he could see. Jonathan was smiling, putting on the brakes. Mrs. Zimmerman heaved a deep sigh of relief. They were across the bridge. As Jonathan opened the door to get out, Lewis twisted around in his seat and saw the other car had stopped just before it got to the bridge. Its headlights were dark now, except for two smoldering yellow pinpoints. Lewis could not tell if there was anyone in the car because the windshield was covered by a blank silvery sheen. Jonathan stood there, his hands on his hips, watching. He did not seem to be afraid of the other car now. Slowly, the mysterious car turned around and drove away. When Jonathan got back to the Muggins' saloon, um, he was still chuckling. It's all over, Lewis. Relax. Witches and other evil things cannot cross running water. It's an old rule, but it still applies. You might throw in the fact, said Mrs. Zimmerman in her most um, pedantic tone, that um, they built that bridge that iron bridge in 1892 he was supposed to be doing it for the country or the county but he was really trying to make sure that the ghost of his dead uncle did not cross the stream to get him now it was now it was part um warlock and what he put into the iron of the bridge oh good heavens cried jonathan covering his ears are you going to go through the whole history of the county at 4 a.m is it that late asked lewis that late or later said jonathan wearily it's been quite a ride they drove on towards new zebedee on the way back or on the way they stopped at an all-night diner and had a large breakfast of waffles eggs american fries sausage coffee and milk and then they sat around for a long time talking about the narrow escape they had just had. Lewis asked a lot of questions, but he didn't get many answers. When they got back to New Zebedee, it was dawn, dawn of an overcast November day. The town and its hills appeared to be swimming in a gray, grainy murk. When Jonathan pulled up to the front of his house, he said, there's something wrong, Florence. Stay in the car with Lewis. Oh, dear, she cried, wrinkling up her mouth. What more can happen? 
Jonathan swung back the iron gate and marched up the walk. From where he was sitting, Lewis could see that the front door was open. This could easily be explained since people in New Zebedee never locked their doors and sometimes the latches didn't hold when they closed them. Jonathan disappeared into the house and he didn't come back for a full ten minutes. When he did reappear, he looked worried. Come on, Florence, he said, opening the door to her side. It's safe to go in, I think, but the house has been broken into. Lewis burst into tears. They didn't steal your water pipe, did they, or the bon, uh, the bonsor coins? Jonathan smiled weakly. No, Lewis, I'm afraid it's not as simple as all that. Someone was looking for something, and I think they found it. Come on in. Lewis expected to find the house in wild disorder, with chairs and lamps smashed and all things scattered around. But when he got to the front hall, he found everything in order. At least that's the way it looked. Jonathan tapped him on the shoulder and pointed towards the ceiling. Look up there, he said. Lewis gasped. The brass cup that covered the place where the ceiling fixture met the ceiling had been pried loose. It dangled halfway down the chain. It's like that all over the house, said Jonathan. Every wall, scones, and ceiling light has had its cup jimmied loose. A few chairs were overturned and a couple of vases were broken, just to make it look like this was an ordinary break-in. But we ought not be fooled. Whoever it was had a general idea of where to look. Come here. Jonathan led Lewis and Mrs. Zimmerman into the front parlor, a more less unused room full of fussy little red velvet chairs. And um, on the wall over to the parlor organ was a brass light fixture, like all others in the house, a tarnished cup shaped thing fitted into the wall and a crooked little brass tube sticking out of it. On the end of the tube was a socket and a light bulb with frilly pink shade. I thought you said the cup was loose, said Lewis. It was. It is, said Jonathan. In this case, um, they tried to fit it back just the way it was, which is kind of stupid, seeing as all the other cups in the house are half-masked. Some of them are slid all the way down to the socket. But I think uh, Hoosis was trying um, in a clumsy way to keep me from looking too closely at this one. Jonathan pulled over a chair and stood up on it. He slid the cup out and peered inside. Then he got down and went to the cellar way for a flashlight. When he got back, Mrs. Zimmerman and Lewis had taken turns looking into the cup. They were both puzzled. What they saw inside the dusty bowl was a greenest rust blot. It reminded Lewis of the stuff um, in the cracks and crevices of copper um, Roman coins they played poker with. It was the mark of something that had lain concealed inside the old brass cup for a long, long time. The mark looked like this. It looks like a clock key, said Lewis in a weak, throaty voice. Yes, it does, said Jonathan. He played the light around um, inside the cup and squinted hard. Uncle Jonathan, what does this all mean? Lewis sounded as if he was about to burst into tears. I wish I knew, said Jonathan. I really wish I knew. All right, guys, and we're going to stop there at chapter seven, at the beginning of chapter seven. Um, and I'm going to show you guys this picture of when they were um, on their drive. It's a pretty cool one. All right, um, leave a comment um an interesting fact what you're thinking what you're feeling um what you think is going to happen next however you want to um leave a comment just to let us know that you are in fact listening um and i will see you guys next time <laughs>